You just saw the George Wilson house uh, that would be north of Manville. Is that yes. right? And that's where Anne currently lives in that house. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had talked much about it, so it's great to have a photo. Good. Thank you. I'm Thank glad you. you like it. <laughs> it's a photo of very early time. It looks a little different now. It's a different color, for one thing. It looks the color of a flower pot. <laughs> <laughs> How cheery. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Well, this is the Oral History Project uh, from the Niobrara County Library in Las Guayoming. Um, and I wanted to remind everyone that additional history and genealogy uh, is available on the library website. So mm -hmm. if anybody has further interest, they can go there. Good. So it's, um, I think I'll get the date right this time, Anne. I think it's May 25th, 2022. <laughs> Absolutely right. Bye. And we have Anne Whitehead here uh, again for our episode three of her memories and her father's and so forth. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, well, before we begin, <coughs> um, I was hoping that you could give us just a, a brief overview again of, your, of the Wilson fam family genealogy, starting with George Campbell Wilson, who was the first guy out here. Oh, right. George, no, George didn't ever come out here. He was the father mm. of George Luther Wilson. Mm -hmm who was the brother to Eugene Parkhurst, no, Eugene Bigelow Wilson. Mm -hmm. They were the brothers who started the ranch out here. And um, their father always stayed in Illinois until the end of his life. He went to live with his daughter briefly in Massachusetts. And he is buried in Petersham, Massachusetts, which is where a lot of the Wilson family members lived which is about 80 miles west of Boston. Mm -hmm. Good. And uh, from there, let's see, my grandfather married and eventually uh, Isabel, and they had four children. And your, excuse me, your grandfather's name was Eugene Bigelow. Eugene Bigelow Wilson. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, my Great uncle George n didn't marry, so he had no children. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that lived then in Guernsey. No, a, a third brother lived in Guernsey, ah. Ed Wilson, Edmund ah. Wilson. Ah. And he was uh, foreman of Charles Guernsey's ranch properties, particularly in Guernsey. Mm, okay, thank you. Good. For many, many years. Good. I think that's it. Then your father then uh, was Eugene Bigelow Wilson's son, one of them. Yes. Right? And that was Frederick, Frederick Brooks. Frederick Brooks Wilson. Yes. Mm -hmm. And his next oldest brother was Kenneth Mack Wilson. And the next oldest was his sister Edna Lucille. And the oldest was Eugene Parkhurst Wilson. Very good. Who is Phyllis Hans' father. father right. Okay, I kind of scoped this out from the genealogy stuff on the website, mm. but I wanted our, our viewers to hear it as well as see it, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Now, when we last left off, um, I believe you were, we were just finishing up stories about Julian. Yes. Do you remember the Julian stories? They were a hoot. <laughs> yes, and I was wishing for more Julian stories. Yes, I know. <laughs> and I, there undoubtedly I were more, too. but... <laughs> But then uh, I think that we were uh, starting, going to be starting uh, a stagecoach journey. Is that correct? Is that the next thing that you had in yes, mind? Yes, that was kind of a cute story. When uh, our, um, my aunt came out to visit the only sister, she came from Massachusetts, and it was three years after George and Eugene had gotten the ranch started. And... Um, she was to come out and to Cheyenne on the train, come north on the stagecoach up to the Rawhide Butte Station, Rawhide Station, and there she would be met by Jean and uh, George. Well, the brothers thought a wonderful idea that they cooked up at the last minute was that one of them would go to Cheyenne and meet her to accompany her on the stagecoach part of the journey. <laughs> And of course, this was before cell phones and uh, instant uh, communication. So um, Helen didn't know that uh, she was to be met in Cheyenne. Uh, 
it was Gene who went down there and he was on the platform waiting when the train came in. Helen didn't know to be looking for him because she didn't know he was going to be there. Mm -hmm. She apparently just stepped blithely over and <laughs> got on the stagecoach and proceeded to come north. And Jean thought maybe she had missed her train, so he waited over another day. And uh, when she arrived at the Rawhide Station, the people there realized what had happened because they had seen Jean off just a few <laughs> days before to go down and meet her. <laughs> they got the word over to George at the ranch, and he came over, of course, and met her right as soon as he could. And uh, eventually, I don't know how they got in touch or who they got in touch with <laughs> Jean. Maybe he telegraphed up to Rawhide and mm -hmm. asked about her. But he came along in a few more days, and uh, uh, Helen spent the summer. Of course, everybody stayed for a long visit. Mm -hmm. Those days it was quite difficult to get out here. But I know she must have been extremely pleased because they hadn't seen each other for quite a long time. Sure. And uh, so they had a wonderful summer together. And then, of course, she went back. She was teaching school at the time in Cambridge. She taught uh, kindergarten, and kindergarten apparently then was more of a learning grade. Um, they did more things. Mm -hmm. It was a real introduction to school. <clears throat> And uh, she taught all of her life mm, there mm. in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm, interesting. <laughs> oh, I bet she has stories to tell about her trip out here. Well, I'm sure she did. And she wrote many, many letters, some of which have been saved. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, she didn't happen to write one about the stagecoach journey. Uh, did she have children? She never married. She never married. So someone in the family has those. Letters. I do. <laughs> oh, you do. Good for you. <laughs> I do. <coughs> the keeper of the family history. Somehow they came to me. Uh, my grandmother was a great collector, <clears throat> and also my Aunt Edna. And I shared with them a great interest in uh, not only the family history, but just history of Wyoming and pertinent things about Wyoming. And uh, whatever they had, each of them eventually gave those things to me to take care of. So well, that's great. I'm taking care of quite a bit of stuff. <laughs> you are. I hope it continues. <laughs> well, let's see. What was next in your father's stories after the stagecoach? Well, uh, I, he was a, a, quite a keeper of records, apparently. Uh, my dad said he was a reporter for many things. Hay production, water, weather, stock. Uh, anything agricultural, and um, he, uh, uh, as a result, he tried to keep up with new things that might be coming out in the way of even equipment and things like that. My my dad said he was always uh, looking for things. He was quite progressive in his thinking of what would be good for the ranch and mm. new equipment and methods, ways mm. of doing things. Um, I can't specifically uh, re remember, or I wasn't told, where he sent these reports, but I'm sure they were govern government agencies mm -hmm. even then mm -hmm. that kept track of all these things. Mm -hmm. so. And to have a, a reporter local, probably probably the only reporter in this area, too. M maybe, because even today, weather is still mm -hmm. faithfully reported by mm -hmm. The county. Local people. Yeah, local people. Yes. <clears throat> um, I'll sidetrack a little here. Mm -hmm. uh, Fred recalled one time in the 30s when he was helping his dad operate the ranch, they loaded several cattle, uh, carloads of cattle destined for Omaha. And he boarded the caboose, which is where the conductor of the train always went, uh, rode on the journey. After he got on the train and they were on their way, Fred realized that he'd forgotten his wallet, so he, <laughs> he didn't have any money or any identification <laughs> or anything. Oh dear. And the conductor said, oh, he said, that's no problem. He said, we've be 
been coming to your place for quite a few years, mm -hmm. and I know you'll pay me back. Oh, <laughs> sweet. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, those were very trusting days. Indeed. Well, I think the next thing that might be of interest, and it may be stepping forward a while, but we will step forward to 1905. Eugene and uh, George, Jean and George, were pretty well established by then in their business. And they got a notion that some of the Eastern relatives might like to come out and go on a trip through Yellowstone Park, which was relatively new at that time. Mm -hmm. So my dad said he remembered they sat around the dining room table one winter and talked and planned and talked and planned because eventually, uh, I've got this written down so that I wouldn't forget, eventually they took two buggies, uh, a mess, what they called a mess wagon, ten horses, Four, four saddle horses and two for the kids. And um, there were six adults who went uh, on the trip, plus Otis Hughes, who was the horse wrangler, and George Priest, who was the cook. And there were five children. Hmm. And there, they had to kind of plan on everything, their uh, tents, their camping mm -hmm. equipment, everything that was needed on the trip. Mm -hmm. They uh, left the ranch, and this was reported uh, in the Lus Carroll, July 13th. E.B. Wilson and family left Tuesday for Edgemont, South Dakota, where they took the train for Cody, Wyoming from which place they will go overland to the Yellowstone Park where they expect to spend two months or so. Hmm. And that was indeed what they did. Goodness. And so they left the ranch uh, in the wagons, I'm sure, got over there to Edgemont, and it was all put on the train. And they wended their way up to the east entrance, which had fairly recently then been opened. But there were people, the people from the East had left earlier and they went out. Lewis and Clark were being remembered with a what they called the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition and American Pacific Exposition and Oriental Fair. It was a lengthy title. That was in Portland? That was in Portland, <coughs> Oregon. And it was held June 1st to October 14th. And they had a theme, Western Course of Empire Takes Its Way. That whole fair was a very successful event. They even sold stock. People bought stock <laughs> and they were repaid quite handsomely oh my goodness. at that time. <laughs> so the Eastern relatives went all the way across the country. They went all the train. way, yes, from Massachusetts. Wow. I think it was called the Pacific Northern, and they went all the way out to Portland. And that's what those pictures are that mm -hmm. we were looking at mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. some of them, were pictures of the exposition out there. Then when it came time to meet with the relatives in Wyoming, they came from Portland back to the north, the east entrance, Cody. Ah. And they all met up successfully. Oh, oh amazing. <laughs> yes. Amazing. <laughs> and uh, they uh, took a few days to kind of reconnoiter. They apparently were, some of their supplies didn't arrive. So Jean went into Cody and bought some more supplies for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Now, was your father one of the children? That went along. Yes, all four of the Wilson oh, children went. Did. Oh my goodness! Yes, did he have any memories of that himself? Oh well, yes. Oh, you're going to get to that. Yes. Oh, fine. Yes, he remembers. I just wanted to that. be sure we were going to get to that. Uh, and one of the uh, <clears throat> one of the participants uh, was considered kind of a 
they were hoping to promote a little romance between uh, a cousin Julian. Uh, no, no, oh, darn. <laughs> no, <laughs> not cousin Julian. Julian story. It was a lady named Ada Brown. She was from Shadron, mm. and um, the the prospect was of uh, some romantic encouragement was being given to George Wilson to, <laughs> but uh, nothing eventually oh. came of that. <laughs> but Ada did contribute one wonderful thing. She wrote a journal of the trip. Oh my. And it's very descriptive and very interesting. And you have a copy? I have a copy of that. Oh. <laughs> yes. And what was her last name? Brown. Brown, Ada Brown. Okay. Yeah, Miss Brown. She taught school. In Shadron? In Shadron. I understood. Ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, the Easterners were uh, named Caroline Wilson. Her husband didn't come, but her son Donald did. And he was about eight or nine years old. And then another relative of ours, Alice Wilson, came with her. And... Um, the four Wilson children came, and Otis Hughes, as I mentioned before, mm -hmm. and George Priest, mm -hmm. and George Wilson, Eugene Wilson, and the, that made up their party. Their equipment was two buggies, one mess wagon, and ten horses, four mm. saddle horses and two for the kids. Hmm. Well, they were gone then. Um July and August mm -hmm. from the ranch. Yes. Well, those are pretty heavy months for the ranch, like haying and all that kind of stuff. So I suppose they had... Well, there were a lot of people. Of course, they contracted the hay to be uh, cut. Uh-huh. But there were many men uh, who worked for the ranch. There were lots of people out mm -hmm. there. Uh, my grandfather kept a very exact journal of day-to-day -day activities. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, I, I have a copy of the information from that journal, and uh, it shows that there must have been, over the years, many, many people. So there were a lot of people oh, out there. And, so. it, and those days were days when you could leave things and people were responsible <laughs> and they took care of it as, sure. as though it was their own. Sure, of course. Yeah, so there was no concern about leaving for that length mm -hmm. of time, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> terrific. <laughs> but it was quite a trip, and um, they saw, of course, many things that are there in the park today that everybody goes up to mm -hmm. see. Because mm -hmm. they started in the east entrance, and they went uh, the southern part and came back up past Faith Old Faithful, and then went on north up to Mammoth, and came back around and back out the east entrance. Mm -hmm. And uh, on their journey, they all rode together coming back because Carolyn, Carolyn uh, the cousin Carol, they always called her, she took a little side trip and went down to see their other brother who lives lived in Guernsey at the time, mm -hmm. Edmund. Mm -hmm. So she rode as far as Edmund, but stayed on the train and went on down there and got off ah. to see him in Guernsey. And then I don't know how their journey was from there. She may have gone to Cheyenne because the train service was good from mm -hmm. Cheyenne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she probably took that. Right. Going back east. How did the rest of them get home back east? They just took the wagons off the train and, and kept on. Climbed on the wagon and went <laughs> home. <laughs> but the eastern people, how did they? They just stayed on the they train. They stayed on the train. From and Edgemont and went on. Edgemont to Guernsey, stayed a little while to visit with Uncle oh, Ed. All of them stayed there. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good. Oh, my. Did, were there any uh, st stories or sightings of wildlife? Did they mention that at all in their? Diary or journal? There must have been uh, lots of wildlife. I haven't reread that journal for a yeah. while. Yeah. They did go fishing. She mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember if she mentioned them seeing bears, which of course is a yeah. big feature now. It there is. are bears and buffalo now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, oh, that's fascinating. But they, uh, 
they apparently had a really wonderful outing in the in the big outdoors. Mm-hmm. It was great then. Right, for the Easterners. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And many things in the park probably looked very familiar to people even who visit the park nowadays. Because the, it's amazing. That's an amazing place. Mm-hmm. Certainly, the is. geysers are still spouting, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. and this was 1905, which is quite a few years ago now. Oh. And uh, they were all, I don't know how many years before they'd all been doing this, but uh, everything was bubbling and spouting. Right. <laughs> as, <laughs> Up as in Yellowstone, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we sort of take it for granted that. Uh-huh. Uh, Old Faithful is just going to keep on being Old Faithful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's been pretty faithful so far. Yeah, so far so good. Mm -hmm. Now I'll kind of maybe jump around a little bit. Uh, Coming back to uh, Lusk, Mm -hmm. there was a man, um, he was named Harry Snyder. He was the, to bring it up to present or more times, he was the grandfather of Jim Griffith. And he had a store in uh, Lusk, a general store, apparently. And my dad just spouted off this little quotation that he credited to Harry Snyder. He termed Snyder, he, my dad called Snyder a Texas merchant in the early years in the state of Wyoming. <laughs> And he said, count that day lost, whose descending son finds prices shot to hell and business done for fun. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know why my dad remembered that. And um, I think you uh, asked me about a pie recipe. Yes. Well, as I remember, was it... Um, let's see, Isabel, yes, maybe, who um, didn't know how to cook. Yeah, yes, she wasn't a, well, she just hadn't been around very many cooks in her life. No, and I had, I had read somewhere that she uh, wanted to make, was it apricot, I think, pie, <gasps> but she didn't soak what... the apricots, and oh. everybody could smell these delicious pies coming out of the oven, but they were totally inedible. <laughs> Oh, disappointment. That's all all I remember. Okay, well, I ran across a recipe called pie magic, and I thought maybe that was what... Oh, no, no. Pie magic. Uh Uh-huh. It tells you exactly what to put in the pie. There's another recipe that did come down through the family for pork sausage. Uh Uh-huh. And it is delicious. But one time, my dad remembered, uh, later in years, his brother... Uh, Jane, who is Phyllis's father, made a batch of this pork sausage, and he put everything in except the salt. Oh dear! And it was a little bit of a disappointment, but it was still <laughs> very good. <laughs> oh. um. The. The man who has sold, I mentioned this is Mr. Heffelfinger, mm-hmm. and he re- was recounting to them one day when he was visiting while he was buying the wool, but he apparently told a story that Fred remembered. Uh, Mr. Heffelfinger said when he got on the train to leave finally and go back, there was a man who ran alongside the train and was sort of happily, gleefully, hollering to him, saying, you'll find some rocks in the bottom of those sacks. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I don't imagine he ever did. They di- surely didn't find them from the Wilsons because Mr. Heffelfinger always bought their wool knowing mm-hmm, yeah. it was going to be good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but my Fred just happened to remember that. Uh-huh. wonder who the fellow was. I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, there's a little incident that happened in Lonesome Dove that I was always intrigued with, and it was when Gus was confronted with some people that were shooting at him or assailants. They were kind of 
hoodlum types, I guess. And uh, he had a gun that he finally kept firing at them. He'd shot his horse, using that as a barricade. And finally, one of these men in the movie came out and was acting like a chicken, kind of cock a doodle doing. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and Gus takes, took his gun and he was aiming and he kept hitting in front of them. And then finally, he aimed and hit and he hit the man. And then the movie, of course, killed him. But I asked my dad one time about that gun and if that was a real possibility that he could actually do that. And my dad said, yes. He said, Gene owned a gun like that at oh one time. Goodness. He said, there's a little special sight that you clip on the gun. But he said, also a gun that's shot like that loses some of its power, but it gains a little bit of distance. And then he told me about a horse they had named Chester. <laughs> he said, when we were growing up, he said Chester was a prize because he said the horse, you could sit in the saddle, place a gun right between his ears and shoot. Hmm. And he said the horse, the minute he felt the gun placed, he said he just froze like he was, he said he would quit breathing almost. Mm -hmm. Well, he said you could do the same thing across his shoulders or oh across goodness. the saddle. And he said he was just a wonder in this world. Oh, of course. But he said, I discovered one day something that he would not tolerate. He said, I was riding along on Chester and he said, I reached in my pocket to get a handkerchief out. And he said, I pulled it out and flipped it. <laughs> and he said, I was immediately airborne. Oh, that's funny. He said, I was hanging on to everything. Oh. And he said, we finally landed and came down. <laughs> he said, that just, Chester wouldn't tolerate oh, that. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> had enough. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Now, I remembered something that I'd forgotten that I remembered, and maybe I didn't remember it. Maybe it was told to me is why I didn't remember it. But when I was little, and I must have been about four or five, maybe like four, my parents were living at the Running Water Ranch for a while, and Uncle George loved bacon and ham and Good, good food, good living. He liked that. He had some pigs that were out behind the sheep barn. And I discovered them, and I discovered they liked to have their backs scratched. Mm -hmm. So they, my parents told me, my mother told me actually one time, that uh, I would be found out there scratching the backs of the pigs, and that was a no-no. Uh -huh. Because pigs are friendly, and they loved having their backs scratched, but sometimes if I had fallen into mm -hmm. the, they don't realize little girls are, little girls that shouldn't be stepped on, and mm -hmm. whatnot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, no, they can be mean, yeah. Yes, so uh, that was one of my things I apparently did. I don't really remember that. Do you have I'm a great sure. affinity for pigs now? I I don't. I think I think, so. I think they're kind of funny animals. <laughs> <laughs> you don't go to the petting zoos. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and one other thing that uh, that I know was told to me. Uncle George had, of course, these marvelous horses. And one day, my mother looked out the window. And I was, there was, used to be a fence around the old house. And I was coming through the gate and I was leading Belle, which was this wonderful, gentle saddle horse. The bridle was sort of tipsy on her head, lopped over her ears, not exactly on, not exactly falling off. And I was leading her into the yard. 
And I must have gone down to the horse barn, Uncle George's horse barn, which is like about a strong city block mm -hmm. from the house. Mm -hmm. Somehow gotten a bridle down and somehow connected with Bill and <laughs> she tolerated my draping the bridle <laughs> over her and leading her all the way up to the house. Oh, goodness. My prize, of course, showing off to the, mm -hmm. look mm -hmm. what I have. <laughs> and how old were you Look there? what I found. I must have been some, about four years four, old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mm. These are just little things out of the blue that I remembered. Oh, that's good, good. Now, I don't remember, did I tell you, help me out, about the railroad coming through the ranch and the crews being headquartered there? No, I don't believe you did. Well, the railroad was built through the ranch and built through from the border of, well, it was a territory then, built up from the border of the Nebraska-Wyoming line, heading up to Douglas and eventually Casper and on west. Um, that summer of 1886, the railroad crew kind of headquartered there at the Running Water Ranch, mm. and they put up tents everywhere. And I have a picture of some of the men sitting there, and I'm sure the picture was probably taken uh, maybe by the man that taught my grandfather how to do photography. Mm, mm -hmm. and, I remember that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it was interesting that they stayed there all through the uh, period of doing that stretch of the, of the uh, railroad until they left going onward mm -hmm. to Douglas. Mm -hmm. So do you remember what the crews were doing? Do you remember any of the work they did? Well, they, they had what they called tie hacks. Oh. And tie hacks, I don't know what they did exactly, but I'm sure they laid the ties down. And the ties were, of course, all wood. Mm -hmm. And it was a very heavy, rough job. I remember a man up in Manville, Gus Johnson, and Gus said that his father got an early job as a young man. He said that's why he was so extremely strong, and he said he had very muscly arms and very strongly built man because he said he did work heavy work like that, hmm. and he was a tie hack oh, on the railroad. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. So, well, I imagine they had people also who were doing the scraping, making the level, moving the dirt. Moving the dirt, probably. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what kind of equipment they had in those days. Mm -hmm. Everything was horse-drawn mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. They had, uh, I, I don't know, I should research that and get a little more familiar with how it, mm -hmm. what it took to build a railroad. Right. That would be interesting, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because equipment was evolving about that time, too. Of there might have been some steam uh, uh, steam generation stuff, maybe. Did you, I, I did don't you remember know. any of that? I should read about that. Mm -hmm. Now, there is and used to be, you used to be able to see it, an Indian trail through the ranch. Uh, James Cook's Ranch, which is down at Agate, Nebraska, and is a wonderful museum down there now, housing Cook's collection. And actually, I don't think Cook collected it. Uh, he was a scout for India uh, during the days at one time. He became quite uh, well acquainted with Red Cloud. And he was, James Cook was given a lot of gifts by the Indians. And I do remember visiting his home one time, his ranch house down there, hmm. when all of these Indian things were still in his house. They were hanging everywhere from hmm. the walls. Uh, <coughs> Goodness. There'd be uh, deerskin 
outfits <coughs> and beadwork and all manner of things. And some of those are on display down there at Agate oh, yes. today. Yes. It's a beautiful museum mm -hmm. to visit. Mm -hmm. But at one time that entire collection was in James Cook's ranch house. And this was, of course, many, many years later. It was before they moved the, everything into the museum. But I remember seeing that enormous collection. Well, those Indians came every summer, and they came west, and they came up and came through past the cabin, hmm. which then was out on the ranch. And that trail is was could be seen at one time. Hmm. I don't know if it can still be hmm. seen, but it was on the ridge that was opposite the cabin. Mm -hmm. And the Indians went onward west to what was called Pumpkin Buttes. And up there, they considered that kind of their summering place, I guess. Mm -hmm. And they would spend the summers <laughs> up there, then reverse the course. Hmm. And there are in... I have a picture of two Indians standing in the doorway of the cabin when it was at its original site. Hmm. And the man standing there visiting with them must be Uncle George, and probably it's Jean taking the picture of them. They have blankets around. They're blanketed, and they're just standing there uh -huh. but that probably is one of their treks when they were either going or coming they just went along the river and up to pumpkin buttes uh Imagine. probably didn't follow the because the river only goes up as far as manville because mm -hmm. it headquarters it heads north of my ranch mm -hmm. there in mm -hmm. manville mm -hmm. uh and the pumpkin buttes are quite a ways farther on west mm -hmm. I wonder but where there was, I don't know exactly how, they how, they, came. how that trail. There are many early maps, and maybe some of that is marked out. Right. I don't know. Interesting. One early map. Of course, down at the uh, Heritage Center in Laramie, and also at the archives in uh, Cheyenne, they have marvelous collections of early day maps. Ah. Maps are really fun to look they at because you can almost visualize the country as it must have looked with no wires, no roads, no fences, no any barriers of any kind, just open country. Mm -hmm. And that's what it looked like when George and Jean came up here. Yeah. There wasn't much fencing. <laughs> a lot of it was just open land. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and people claimed a certain amount of land in their homesteading and they were beginning to mark out what was theirs and what was their neighbors, but that took a lot of years before they mm -hmm. really got this place all fenced up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of fun, fun if you can kind of remember it and visualize it in your mind. They had a lot of visitors that came to the ranch. And I have some pictures of visitors from Illinois, especially, that came out. They came when you mentioned George Camel Wilson. Uh, he was kind of a, he and his wife, Arethusa, were sort of pioneers. They came in 1837, the year they were married, from Massachusetts and this little town of Petersam that I mentioned. And they came to a place in Illinois called Como, and it was a colony. And I never realized until I got into this genealogy business that some of the eastern uh, colonies sponsored then, in turn, colonies farther west because the East Coast was beginning to be filled up with people who were coming. And in Massachusetts, they just kept pushing farther, and they called it the frontier. People kept going a little further west, a little further west, a little further. And so finally, they made the jump. And Como is on the west side of present-day Illinois. 
It's south and west of Chicago. Near, it's near Davenport, mm -hmm. Iowa. And um, uh, when they came out there, it, there were many people, some of them came from also Petersham, but a lot of this colonization uh, took place in other areas up and down the Mississippi River because that was when Britain was still wanting to claim land over in the northern part mm -hmm. of the United States. Mm -hmm. Spain and France, of course, were in the more southern parts. But it, it was kind of an interesting time, I think, that these eastern original colonies became interested in helping the westward movement. Is that then where George and Jean came from? Is that Como? Como. They came well, from that one, they didn't come from Como. It was their father and his wife, Arethusa. And they came to Como on their honeymoon, really. <laughs> they, he had come out the year before to look at it, mm -hmm. to see what it was like mm -hmm. and if it was okay to do it. And so they kind of were the first venturers, hmm. the pioneers out to Illinois. And where did where were Jean and, and um, George born? They were born in Como. So when they moved west, they moved from Como. Right. Mm -hmm. And there were originally William, who served in the Civil War, uh, war between the states. He contracted what they always said was measles, but he became so sick that they the, they left him when the group that he was a part of, his regiment or whatever it was called, I have the record of it, but I don't remember the name. Uh, they were, went on to Vicksburg. They sent him back to be discharged. Mm -hmm. And he came home, and he never, re I guess, recovered his health. Mm -hmm. And he died about three years after he came home mm -hmm. from whatever it was that he contracted mm -hmm. during the Civil War. Then there was a girl born, Juliana. She was the first Juliana. And then uh, George was born, Jean, and uh, Helen was born first, George, Jean, and hmm. their younger brother. Didn't know there was a Juliana. Mm-hmm. Did she, she only survive? lived to be about five years old. Oh. And she and Arethusa are buried there in Como. I visited there one time. Uh-huh. It's a sweet town. I had a little map that was folded up many, many times that must have been given to my grandfather. And it was saved, and I have it framed and put into con conservative whatever they call it, archival mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. material. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that little town is perfectly remains oh, just like this map, as oh. if no one had ever disturbed it. Interesting. <laughs> it, was, it was almost eerie yeah. to visit there. I need, I, so I need to know, since we're about 45 minutes in, mm -hmm. um, is there more? Shall we schedule another time? Do you have more today? <sighs> I I don't think I I don't think I have too much more. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little more. I'll I'll leave through here because I've marked a few things. Okay. Do we have more time on the tape? We do. Who knows? Hey. Yeah. <laughs> stop. Okay. So why don't we stop today? It's because we're not sure about how much time Sounds we have good. left. And then we'll proceed next time if you have more yes. to tell us. Yes, and in fact, if there's just a little bit more, I'll look through here and see. Okay, okay. well, why don't we just pause here then, and then uh, you can go ahead and look, and we'll reconvene later today. That sounds very good.